Alright, what's going on everybody? Enzo here from Enzo's Geckos. So, before this video starts, I'd just like to give you guys a huge thanks. We have right around 280 subscribers right now, and we're getting close to that 300 mark, and a whole lot closer to that 1000 mark, which I did not even think uh, we'd get this close to this uh, early in 2020 already, but by 2021, I think we'll definitely be able to hit 1000 subscribers. So, uh, thank you guys so much for that. Also, on my last video, I got a lot of support um, from you guys, so that means a lot. And uh, in this video, we're just going to be talking about leopard gecko genetics. Um, leopard gecko genetics work pretty much the exact same way as genetics do for ball pythons, for humans, for, you know, whatever, oxalotls, I don't know, sugar gliders, whatever the heck has genetics in them, this is pretty much how it works. So we're going to go over some dominant stuff, uh, co-dominant and recessives, because, uh, you know, that's just the simple stuff. We can do polygenic traits a little bit later, um, but uh, we're just going to start off with some really simple stuff. So dominance, recessives, um, codoms, because that is in leopard geckos, and then uh, I'll try and do my best to explain it. So uh, my background in understanding genetics is when I was in 8th grade, uh, we learned a little bit about Punnett squares, uh, which is something I'm going to teach you guys, but it's pretty much a way to tell uh, what the probability is of a genetic um, pairing, right? The, the genetics of a baby would be like uh, for the pairing based on a certain trait. So um, I learned that in eighth grade, so that helped me a lot to understand it when I got into leopard geckos, and uh, I, got, I got to understand it really fast. So uh, I just thought that I should uh, introduce you guys to Punnett squares as well when we start writing. So um, I start doing this. So this is just leopard gecko genetics. One oh one. All right, there we go. Leopard gecko genetics one oh one. So. We're going to just go over something incredibly simple called um, a Punnett square. So essentially a Punnett square is just a normal square that you would just set up like this, a little box, right, with four, four little uh, windows, okay? And essentially what you have here is you put the genetics of the male or female, parent one and parent two, like right one on the top, one on the side or bottom, you know, whichever two corners uh, you'd like it to be so that you can tell. And uh, you have this, and essentially, whatever you would imagine that the adult, or the, the parent gecko, uh, that the genetics it would have for something, um, you pretty much put those right here. So uh, we're going to use also letters to express, gene, to express genes. So um, first of all, a dominant gene might show up something like this. So let's say that something is a dominant gene, okay? Let's say AA is what it is. So the big A, as long as it has one A, right, the one uppercase, as long as it has that dominant, it will display that trait no matter what. So if it is dominant for, you know, if it, let's say that it carries, I don't know, uh, uh, let's just say it's something like white and yellow, okay? If it has one, if it just displays that, just one white and yellow, let's just say that this A stands for the white and yellow gene in leopard geckos, or maybe something, uh, I don't know, like the Mojave gene in ball pythons, you know, for codominant. Um, as long as it shows just one of those, it will be present in the animal visually. And so we know that for sure. Dominants work like that. Well, this there's always two, okay, because there's two alleles in the uh, chromosomes, you know, in the, in the genes of an animal. There's two alleles. So one allele uh, is either dominant or recessive or codominant or whatever. So... This little one right here would be a recessive. So the big one, the uppercase letter, that is dom, dominant, or codom, as we like to put it in the uh, reptile hobby. So dominant or codom. And then a lowercase is what we call recessive. So if something is lowercase and it's recessive, it needs both two of those alleles to, ha display, to have this in order for the animal to display it visually. So once again, if something has two alleles, so let's say the animal's alleles look like this, right? Let's say we have a leopard gecko. It, this is what it has. This is the gene for what it looks like to be a normal leopard gecko, right? What it looks like to be completely normal. And then this is what it needs. This recessive gene is what it needs to be albino. Well, because one of them is normal, because it's dominant or codominant, it will automatically be express itself as normal. And even though there is one recessive gene, one recessive allele to be there, the animal won't display itself as albino. It won't be a visual albino. It will be a heterozygous albino, which means it carries that. So heterozygous means two different. Het, het, hetero means different. Homo means the same. So if it's homozygous, 
Um, if it's homozygous, uh, albino, right? So this would be homozygous, AA, because they're the same. This would be a visual albino, because it would not be het albino. So we just call this het albino because it's heterozygous, because it means that the genes are different, or the alleles are different. So one allele makes it look one way, the other allele makes it look a different way. So once you, those are together, whichever one is the dominant one or co-dominant one will make it look like that. So essentially, if an animal has this, if this is what it takes for it to look like a normal leopard gecko, and this is what it takes for it to look like an albino and have the albino gene, it will look normal even though the albino gene or the albino allele, excuse me, would still be there. But if there are two albino alleles, because it is recessive, these two lowercase a's mean that it will display itself as visual albino. So it has its alleles, there's two recessives, so that is what we call homozygous, okay? So we know we, no one really calls it homozygous, it's just the term for it. So this would just be homozygous and this would be heterozygous. So in the hobby we call it het. You've probably heard that word somewhere if you're looking at an animal to purchase or you're looking at somebody's post and it says Trumper albino het eclipse or blazing blizzard het diablo blanca or something like that, right? So it means that it carries that gene to reproduce it and pass it off. However, it does not carry that gene and display it visually. So that's the difference, right? This recessive right here, if it's homozygous albino, it will show it. If it's heterozygous albino, it will not show it. So essentially that's pretty much how it works. It's very simple. Sometimes it does, you know, it's, it's simple um, in the way that it's kind of explained, but it's kind of hard to understand completely. So we're gonna go and right here ahead, go ahead right here and draw a Punnett square, which I already have drawn out. And let's say that we have a pairing, okay? So let's say the mother is a normal, okay? So a normal het albino. So A, A. That would be, let's just say for A, for A we're gonna imagine that it's the albino allele, the albino trait, right? The albino, albino morph gene, whatever you'd like to call it. And then let's say that the father is a visual albino. So this means he's homozygous albino and she's heterozygous albino. So instead of just saying he's a homozygous albino, we just say he's an albino, just because he displays it visually. So even though she's an albino, it's heterozygous albino, so you don't see it visually. Just because she carries one of the alleles, it's still heterozygous albino because het means it's different, so the two alleles are different in what uh, makes her display being albino or not. So right here we're gonna do, all right, here's the mother, A, A, and the father, lowercase a, lowercase a. So we have that erase this and this is what's gonna happen so the, you just pretty much draw it like this and then these will all pass down so in the first one it will look like this right a a the second one okay two a's a a and then these come down together two more a's so from this pairing if you were to pair a normal het albino a normal heterozygous for the albino morph it would to a visual albino, homozygous albino, so essentially looking at it in the way of letters and genetics, you would get this. So you would get 50% this and 50% that. So now what does that mean? It means that 50% of the time, 50% of the hatchlings will be, will be a normal leopard gecko het albino, heterozygous albino, because they carry that right there. And it also means that fit the other 50% will be visual albinos. So this, so just think of that as right recessive is visual. If it's a double recessive, it's homozygous and it's visual. Okay, so any, any morph of leopard geckos um, that have, uh, that are recessives are stuff like um, eye pigments, albinos, and then some uh, pattern stuff. So stuff like, you know, um, Eclipse, Marble Eye, um, Nor Desire Black Eye, Tremper Albino, Bell Albino, Rainwater Albino, some of the newer stuff like Cypher, uh, I'm pretty sure Oddball, whatever, you know, the one that Steve Sykes is working with. Those ones are all recessive as well. Murphy's Pattern List, Blizzard, all those, you know, those ones are, uh, are recessives. So by knowing that, you know, we can predict what the odds are that we will get a baby that is a visual or that a, vi that a baby is heterozygous or het. So we know that half the babies will just look normal, but they'll be het albino, and we know that half of the babies will be visual albinos because we have that double recessive right here, which we would not have in these other ones. So 
Now let's talk a little bit about a different pairing, maybe, okay? Let's do, let's do a different pairing, okay? Let's say, let's say there is an animal that is, you pair two heads together, okay? So you pair two animals uh, together that each are carriers for a recessive gene, a recessive allele, they each have a recessive allele, but they don't display it visually. So let's see what would the odds be like of getting a recessive baby out of that. So then you can kind of calculate what you'd be getting if you'd be making these pairings. So here, once again, we're gonna draw our box. So, there we go, right? Mom and dad both look like normal leopard geckos, but they carry the gene for albino. So, let's fill it in. And if you guys wanna pause the video at any time and just kinda of write this down for yourself and figure it out, um, I think it's a great thing to do. I definitely learned this um, by watching other people's videos and checking it out and just talking to breeders and you know doing my own research, of course, which is really important, but uh, this video should probably help you out a little bit. So what we're going to see here is there's three different combos. We have AA, AA, and AA. Well, capitals, one capital, one lowercase, and two lowercase. So that means we got one here, so 25% will be visual normals. They will not even carry the gene for uh, albino. That will be completely bred out of them. There's a 25% chance that if it's a, you know, if it, the, the, the baby will look to be a normal just because it has these two dominant alleles there that block out the albino. So even though the albino is in both of the parents, in this case, the two dominant genes that block out the albino are taking over and there's no way that this animal would be able to have albino in its genetics at all, any of the alleles. Now there's 50%, capital A, lowercase a, right? Because these two right here come down, that's 50%. And that means that half of them will be hets. So if you pair a het to a het, half of them will be hets as well. Half of these guys will have a capital A and a lowercase a, and a capital A and a lowercase a, which means that they carry their heterozygous albino, or whatever genetic you'd like to, you know, fill in the blank right there. And then one quarter of them, another 25%, will be lowercase a's, which means it will be a visual recessive. So if you pair a het to a het, you have a 25% chance of getting a visual for whatever genetic that would be. So this is only talking about single traits. This is only talking about um, traits with one recessive in them, which of course, as we know, um, uh, ball pythons, there's like four, there's been a four or five gened uh, recessive animal. In leopard geckos, there's usually three gened uh, recessive sometimes. Um, some breeders are still trying to work towards a four, uh, visual four recessive animal. But when you look at it like that, you can pretty much just see how it works out to the point where we can just get it to do uh, normal recessives and think about it like that and using um, a Punnett square to figure out how it would work. So now that we understand how that works, and we have, so let's just go over really quickly what we learned. So if an animal is, has recessives, right? It needs to be homozygous for that recessive trait it will be visual, it will be visual, and it will have the two recessive alleles. Now, if it is heterozygous, it will carry the recessive trait. And it will be het. Now, if it's completely like that, if it's completely both are dominant, it will just look normal. It will completely look normal because there's no recessives in there and it will not be able to pass down any kind of recessives because there's nothing in there. So even though these two would look completely like normal leopard geckos, one of them would be a carrier for the recessive trait, one of them would not be, and this one would be a visual uh, of that recessive trait. So that way you can kind of understand, you know, if you're doing a pairing, what would, what would, um, what you would get out of it based on the percentages. So now, 